Nice to meet you guys. Uh, my name is Ravi, uh, and thanks for coming along to the informa uh, information session for my seminar. Um, for my uh, the the information session for my uh, boot camp. Um, so uh, I just want to start off by uh, really saying who should be here and what is this program for, um, and maybe some prerequisites that. Uh, you guys maybe should have done or, or should do after this talk. Um, so uh, this program uh, is for anybody uh, that has done any programming course. Um, it, the program is designed to get you internships or full-time offers from big tech companies. That is our primary purpose. Um, and uh, uh, it also helps uh, uh, getting offers from many, many, many other really awesome companies as well. Um, so uh, I did a talk uh, in this room last year called A Step-by-Step -step Guide to Getting uh, uh, to Passing Silicon Valley Internship. I think that's the name of the talk. I've uploaded it to YouTube. It's attached to all the ads. Um, so if you haven't read that, uh, if you haven't watched that yet, please go ahead and watch that um, uh, tonight or um, as soon as possible. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, let's, let's get started into the uh, information session. Uh, so, oh, is this working? Okay, awesome. So, uh, big thanks to the two sponsors uh, that are hosting this information session. Um, they're actually, uh, they've supplied all the pizzas and drinks for afterwards, so uh, everyone, uh, thanks a lot to them. Um, so, I'll just quickly say a couple things about both, about both of the um, um, clubs. So, the first one is uh, the, uh, the Computer Science Club. So, um, this is a club that's been around in the university for a while. And uh, it's a great place if you want to come and meet people who are doing um, programming and it helps. Um, so like some of the things they offer are there's um, um, constant networking events um, that they host. They have resources to help people with uh, your um, coursework and exams. Um, they also host uh, uh, pub crawls twice a year. Um, uh, and um, they do some more stuff, but I've forgotten. Um, <laughs> uh, they'll be up there if you want to go and have a chat to them um, and sign up and get involved. Um, and they'll be uh, up in the foyer after this. Um, and the second club, um, Competitive Programming Club. Uh, so this club hosts a bunch of competitive programming competitions throughout the year. Um, and they put a lot of energy into trying to train you guys how to be better at competitive programming. So they have um, a... Uh, a coach who uh, went to world finals twice, his name is Max Ward, um, and he gives um, workshops um, to help train, um, train everyone into being better at competitive programming. Um, and they also have uh, um, barbecues um, and a quiz night. Um, but both of these clubs are excellent societies, and if you're new to, uh, if you're in the first year, or if you haven't ever got, gotten involved in any community here in university bef before, um, I personally think it's crucial to get involved in, in one or both of these communities. Um, there, you'll be surrounded by like-minded people who all want the same thing, want to succeed. Um, and if I wasn't a part of these communities back in my undergrad, um, I wouldn't have met the right people to learn how to, you know, get internships and stuff. So. Definitely recommend uh, signing up to these guys, uh, or I guess at least having a chat to them and then meeting them. Um, anyways, so uh, what exactly is this uh, study program? So uh, this is a uh, uh, this program is not attached to the university. Um, it's not affiliated to the university at all. Um, it is an intensive Navy SEAL style boot camp where we train students over the summer um, to be able to pass interviews uh, for software engineering, for, uh, uh, for internships, for full-time roles at big tech companies. Um, we aim at uh, some of the biggest uh, tech companies in the world, so um, big fan companies, Google, um, Microsoft, Facebook, or Meta. Um, and uh, it's, an in, it's an intensive program um, where it's, you don't always just because you sign up to the program doesn't mean you're going to finish it. So when I say it's a Navy SEALs style boot camp, it, it's, um, we have a bar that everyone needs to be reaching every week. Um, and that's basically how many hours you, um, are you putting into the program. Uh, and if people start to drop off and not put the work in, then they are removed from the program. Um, so uh, I'll jump into some stats about previous years. 
Uh, we've run this for two years now. This will be the third um, year this summer. And overall, we've had 224 people sign up to the program, uh, and only 84 people have finished the program. And this is a testament to how tough the program is, um, of how much work we want you to put into this. Uh, so of the 84 people who have uh, finished um, across them, there is 88 um, offers in total. Um, as far as I know, some of them may have got offers and not told me about it, but you know, these are all the ones who told me about their offers. Um, and half of, half of those offers, uh, so 45 of them, are at big tech companies um, or um, high frequency trading companies. So some of the notable ones, um, Google, Amazon, uh, Atlassian, Palantir, Canva, and um, a, a few of like, the really good high, uh, high frequency trading companies as well. So Jane Street, IMC, Optiva, and Acuna Capital. Um, so we've had people getting multiple offers from all of these companies. Um, so this year, um, uh, there'll be a new coordinator. Um, um, his name is Sean Gunawana, and uh, he did the program in the first year. Um, and Sean, uh, across the last two years, has received uh, six offers in total. Um, and notably, he'll be interning at Google this summer. Um, so he is a great resource, and the program is in good hands with him. Uh, so to explain what the program is and walk you through the entire boot camp, uh, I'm going to introduce him, come up on stage, Sean, and he's going to walk you through the whole program. Um, I'll come back for some little bits at the end, and we'll have um, a Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, um, uh, wait until the end. We're going to have like 20 to 30 minutes of Q&A. So um, please just hold questions until the end. Um, anyways, take it away, Sean. Hello. Can, can, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So, yeah. Well, I mean, what a great turnout. Thanks. Go, thank you all for coming. And you're all here to learn about RSP. Hopefully, you've seen the video. Learn about exactly what you'll be involved with. And also, uh, but I think I have a suspicion that undoubtedly a lot of you are here to answer one question. And that's, what the hell is going on with RSP? You know, why are there? Why is there such a low graduation rate? And why do the people who do graduate, graduate spectacularly with uh, getting offers from many different companies and lots of big tech companies as well? So what is actually going on? And hopefully, I'll try to answer those questions over the next 15 minutes. So first of all, we'll talk about where you'll be. So the Discord server is where all of the action will happen. Um, this is where you'll be communicating with other students. You'll be communicating with uh, all the mentors will be there, including Ravi and I. And um, yeah, this is where most of the action will happen for you guys. So it's where, it's where you can get advice. It's where you can get advice on your resume and LinkedIn. It's, uh, it's where you can work, work on lead codes with everyone. And a really cool thing about the Discord server is that there's a bunch of full-time Google, Microsoft, Facebook, big tech, full-time employees in the Discord server as well. And our, I guess the vision for the program moving forward is to keep growing that list of full-time employees. So if you think about it, new graduates come in, they graduate, get internships, get full-time office, and this list will keep growing. So the Discord server is already like that. It's already a great place to, that, that fosters these individuals. And you can get a lot of feedback from them as well. So it's a great resource. Um, and if you take a list, of all of the things you have to do in RSP uh, over the three months, and you just put them in one big list, the list will seem so big, and it will hardly look accomplishable over the three-month period. So to ease the process a little bit, we decided to gamify the entire experience by having these four, well, I guess three main hurdles. So we'll start off with beginner. So what does it mean to be a beginner? Well, that's what you are if you've joined the program and if you've made it through application process. So when you're a beginner, you'll mostly be doing theory study. And this is easily the hardest part of the entire program. Now, most people, as you saw, there was a high dropout rate. And most people do either drop out or get kicked out during the beginner stage. And that's because of these two textbooks here. So there's the first 86 pages of CTCI, Craig in the Coding Interview, and also the first 10 chapters of Algorithm Design Manual. So it's especially ADM that's quite tricky because it's a lot to read. And not only do you need to read and understand it, but chances are you'll have to look at a bunch of other videos as well to make sure you really understood the topics. So yeah, this, this wipes out a lot of people from the program. 
However, th there is some enthusiasm towards some. You can look at it optimistically in that if you do make it through the novice stage, uh, sorry, if you make it through the theory study stage, you're more than likely going to be able to stick around for the rest of the program, uh, statistically speaking. So if you can get past this first title, that'll be good. So as a recommendation, just to make it a bit easier to go through the process, um, we recommend starting theory study early. If you can get the first promotion to novice as soon as possible, then uh, you'll have a lot more time to start the technical study. So yeah, so that's with theory study. And another thing you'll also have to do as you're in beginner is implement some fundamental algorithms and data structures. Um, OK, so it's a bit iffy there. But uh, if you've made it through beginner, you can get promoted to novice through an interview. One of your mentors will be uh, hosting that interview for you. The deadline to reach novice is uh, off, at the end of the fifth week of the program. And it's non-negotiable. This, this, so this is the part where people get kicked out. If you don't complete all of the theory study by the end of the fifth week, you're out of the program. There's no negotiation for that rule. But if you do get in there, uh, now you can start all of the fun stuff. So primarily, you'll be working on uh, leak code and mocks, but you'll also be working on your personal profile. So that includes your uh, LinkedIn, your resume, and you'll also be working on a project as well. Um, but the fun stuff is the lead code, you could say. So for those of you who don't know, lead code is a, it's a database of 2,400 plus continuously going, growing list of uh, interview questions that companies give out. And it's continuously being updated. Now, we don't expect you to do 2,400 questions over three months, but we do expect you to go through about 50 to 100. And the reason for this is there's only about 50 core concepts that you need to have understood to a good degree. And once you have those 50 down, you could take, say, any set of lead code questions, and you could apply some combination of those core concepts to those uh, set of questions and answer all of them. So uh, we'll get you to go through about 50 to 100 instead. And assuming you've done them as well as you could have, you'll have the building blocks you need to pass pretty much every coding interview. Um, oh, yeah, so the requirements are 10 lead codes a week. So this is another one of those mandatory requirements. It's 10 a week. Um, that's non-negotiable as well. So you'll have to do 10 a week every week. And the 10 consists of two to four ECs, a majority of mediums, and two hearts. In the beginning of the program, we'll, we, we'll be a bit more lenient for you in regards to how many ECs you do. But fundamentally, throughout the entire program, you'll be doing Mostly hearts, sorry, mostly mediums and two hearts. Um, yeah, and this is what it'll look like. So every time you do a lead code question, you'll time yourself and you'll put it on that spreadsheet. You all get a spreadsheet similar to this one. So when you time yourself, you time yourself from the beginning of when you open the lead code question all the way until either two hours have elapsed or you get an accepted submission on lead code. You sh you're not allowed to leave your desk until you've done the uh, until either of those two conditions are met. So the reason we do that is because, well, first of all, in the real interviews, the process is timed, the entire thing. So uh, it, it's good to get used to that as soon as possible. So starting straight away through the LECO process timed is quite helpful. Um, and also, you can see your progress uh, throughout each LECO question, which can be quite motivating, especially seeing your times go down. So. Uh, yeah, that's what the spreadsheet is for. Now, another thing you'll have to do every week are two mock interviews. It's another hurdle. Oh, sorry, it's another requirement uh, every week. So easily the most fun part of the program and also the most useful. So mock interviews are extremely useful. And OK, well, first of all, what they are is like, say you're a novice. Um, you're going to find someone else who's also a novice. I'm going to organize a two-hour block with them to give and take one interview each. and. Um, a mock interview consists, is 45 minutes, consists of one five-minute behavioral question, followed by a lead code easy and a lead code medium. Um, and what makes mock interviews so useful? Well, there's a few things. First of all, you've probably done your set of lead code questions, and your partner has probably done a different set of lead code questions. So what happens is when you two 
communicate with each other through the interview process and give advice to each other, you're not only be able to essentially conduct a performance, which is the interview itself, you're also able to get valuable feedback from someone who's seen a different set of questions than you. So that, that ends up being quite useful. Um, I'd say the most useful thing about it is its difficulty. So we'll just go to this next slide here. Right, so we, uh, each mock interview is assessed by six different categories um, of rubric. And you'll get a score from 0 to 10 for each of them. If you get a single, um, if you get a single number below 5 for one interview, you'll fail the entire interview. Right, so that's the cool thing. And you, know, you might be wondering, well, you know, that seems a bit much. Like, I mean, if you look at the, bottom, the guy on the bottom there, you know, he got everything right except for confirming the question a little bit. They might have forgotten to confirm something. So why is the entire thing a fail? And it's, you really you build on the harshness of the interview. Um, if you do like 10 to 20 mock interviews, which you will do throughout the program, if you get, if you get into a real interview, it's going to seem so much easier for you um, that you could hardly compare the two. So it's, it's always useful to go through that process. And another thing is you also get to, you're forced to work on the micro habits of your interview. So you could go through your entire interview, do it really well, but if you don't do complexity analysis, for example, uh, sufficiently, you'll be forced to focus on improving that. So this rubric, while it is harsh, it's exceptionally useful. And a lot of you guys, especially if you're new to lead code, will be failing like all of your first interviews, but that's completely normal. It's a part of the learning process. Um, OK, so once you do all that, plus the other tasks, you'll get promoted to intermediate uh, through, through another interview. Now, the, I believe the uh, deadline for intermediate is five weeks after you reach novice. Once you reach intermediate, you're, you're safe. You can consider this the final hurdle of the program. So yeah, once, once you reach it, you, you can't get kicked out unless you like, go around harassing people in the Discord server. You're pretty much, pretty much safe. So, um, so the things you have to do, or you'll get to do once you reach intermediate, uh, take everything you've done on, take all the technical things you've done on uh, novice and duplicate it. So another 10 a week, lead code, another two mock interviews a week. And on top of that, you'll also be doing uh, other subtasks. So that includes um, a cover letter template. You'll be creating one of those. I say template even though companies tend to, uh, it's, it's better to send a cover letter that has at least one paragraph that's specific for that company. But otherwise, you'll be creating a template cover letter that you can pass through. Um, you'll also be creating a portfolio website, which is pretty similar to your resume, but it's more experience focused. And you'll get a chance to detail your experience, experiences in a much more detailed manner. Um, what else is there? There's also competitions. So one, com one competition, and for example, um, the CPC Club is a great resource for this. They host the International Collegiate Programming Contests quite frequently. And outside of that, there's also hackathons as well. And uh, finally, you'll also be required to do some community involvement, so volunteering. And definitely the best way to do this is, to, uh, is through one of these two clubs. Uh, there'll be plenty of opportunities both over the summer and throughout the year for you to get involved um, with volunteering events. And you could even um, perhaps sign up to one of these two clubs, and that'll cover your community involvement requirement. Um, otherwise, uh, there's also plenty of other ways, such as volunteering in O-Week. So regarding community involvement, the, and your, oh yes, right, and there's also another project that you'll have to do. So regarding your projects and community involvement, it's easier if you start these before you reach intermediate. Now, you can start these once you reach intermediate, but um, you're, you're giving yourself more time to actually complete the tasks once, uh, if you start it early enough. Um, and that's the same with your projects as well, and the theory study. So you might be wondering, well, what's, what's the queen there for, considering you're pretty much safe once you reach intermediate? Well, it's optional to aim for advanced, but I'll try to create a case why I encourage you to try and reach for advanced. So it's been my experience mentoring last year that the 
students who do make it to advanced, they're, they're superstars. They can, there's hardly a coding interview you can put in front of them that they can't do. They're really quite, they're really quite an amazing bunch, the people who did make it to advanced. So there tends to be a high correlation between making it to advanced and also uh, being ready for coding interviews at big tech companies. The only condition to this is you take the program seriously. If you, like, you, you don't fake your times on lead code or you don't make up questions, you uh, dedicate yourself towards that time period. Another thing is um, the process to get to advance is made easier for them um, since a lot of them have finished the theory study early. So that's another reason to try and finish uh, the theory study as soon as you can. Um, oh, and here's a cool thing about the theory study that I forgot to mention earlier. If, you've, um, if you're a first year and you're doing RSP and then you're doing algorithm design and data structures, ADS is going to be so easy for you that you could hardly consider it a uni course. And, and seriously, I, I, I do mean that in that you learn way more than uh, what uni is going to teach you. So you could pretty much breeze through the entire thing once you get this. That, yeah, that's another advantage of um, joining the program, I guess. Um, and yeah, so advance is the final part of the puzzle, and that's essentially the program structure. So once you reach, uh, once you're in the program, you will each have a mentor. And Ravi and I, we, we went through the list of graduates, and we picked about, I think, 16 mentors. And uh, each of them are, uh, they're amazing. They've, they've went through the program. Um, really well, they were quite active, and they, they, all of them got amazing offers at big tech companies um, or high frequency trading firms. So you'll be in good hands once you get your mentor. And what they'll help you with is they'll provide support for you throughout the program. Um, they'll also be there to uh, do your promotional interviews, so for each hurdle. And they'll also be there to help motivate you and track you. And the main way, well, track, lack of a better word, but the main way they'll track your progress is through these progress reports. So every Monday, you'll hop on the Discord. You'll post a report similar to that on the respective channel. So it's essentially how many hours you've done approximately in the week, and also the tasks that you've done in that week. So this will allow your um, mentors to keep track of you. Um, whoops. And if you do fall behind, um, uh, at any point, they'll, they'll be there to uh, help you get back up, essentially. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much the program structure. I'll uh, hand it over to you. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> um, so we've, we've said it a few times already um, that there's a high dropout rate. And um, I guess I want to say this, that we do expect you to bin your entire holidays. And that isn't for everyone. Um, we basically, as soon as exams finished, no break, immediately start grinding many chapters of a textbook every week. And um, keep that in mind if you're planning to sign up to this program. Um, and really, um, you know, I. Uh, Sean has already said it, but I'm going to repeat it again because I, I personally believe it's the, uh, one of the most important indicators to success in this program. And that's starting the theory study as soon as possible. Um, there, uh, for some, the five weeks isn't enough. And for, for half of the people that start the program, the five weeks is, yeah, is definitely not going to be enough. And if, if you want to make sure you don't get booted out after the first um, hurdle, uh, I would start the study as soon as possible. Um, right now, if you can, uh, as soon as you find like a window or every night, start putting two hours before bed towards it, or every morning, put an hour or two uh, um, towards the theory study. Um, but if you can get through um, most of um, the textbook or you know, a minimum of, of half of the, of, of the algorithm design manual, uh, the chances of you uh, not getting promoted and, and not passing the program is, is very low. Um, I, I'm thinking about it and uh, everybody that has finished the theory study within the first one, two, three weeks of the program, every single one of those people have uh, made it through to the end and um, the ma large majority of those people have gotten offers. Um, 
So uh, that's one little caveat I want to slip in there. Please start early. Um, uh, yeah, so key dates of the program. Uh, well, it starts the Monday after the last exam that Adelaide University has. Um, so uh, 24th, uh, 21st of November. Uh, and uh, I think Sean has already mentioned these dates, but I'm just gonna go over them again. Uh, oh, we expect you to finish all the theory study and get, and get to novice um, uh, by the end of the first week of January. And then about roughly five weeks after that, we expect everyone to, to get through to the next hurdle. Um, and uh, the program will end the, the last Friday before the uh, uh, semester one starts. So literally no, no break. You're, <laughs> it's just gonna be constant work from now all the way to through uh, until you start an internship because you just go from like this year, RSP, all of next year, and then internship. So um, keep that in mind. Uh, so, uh, all right, the applications are, are gonna be open until next Friday. Um, and uh, we, we don't take everybody that comes in. Um, uh, what we do wanna see is that you are available full time. Uh, now, I've already been reached out to some people uh, about a particular question, and uh, we had some people last year doing this as well. Um, but uh, what if you are uh, doing an internship th this summer? Um, can you do RSP? Because we do say on the uh, on the uh, application form that we want you to be putting full time hours into this, and. Uh, last year, we actually did take a, a, a number of people who were interning, uh, but over 90% of those people who were interning and trying to do RSP at the same time um, pulled out of the program at some point. Um, however, there were a select few people who did do need internships and RSP, but those people got promoted, uh, uh, finished all the theory study within the first um, um, a one or two weeks. Uh, and that gave them time to get started on the leak code and basically the next, like, uh, uh, the second hurdle straight away from like December. So that is uh, one little caveat we'll be throwing into the study program this year is uh, if you're working full time or doing an internship full time uh, this summer, uh, will take you, but your deadline for getting promoted to um, like finishing all the theory study will be within the first one or two weeks of the program. Um, just because uh, uh, we want to make sure that you're thinking about it early and you're starting the study early. Um, and you know, if, if you plan to start studying uh, um, the theory uh, after the last exam and you want to do an internship, um, I don't think that's going to work uh, uh, unless you really, really convince us. But um, yeah, that's kind of a rule that we're going to be putting in place this year. Um, so uh, the link to sign up is all over the advertisements, um, but if you haven't signed up, go ahead and scan. Um, if you have questions, please direct them to Sean. Um, so his email's here, take a photo if you want. Um, so now what I'm going to do is going to get um, a bunch of people who have gotten some cool offers up on stage. Um, they're going to say their names, uh, uh, what course and what year were they before they did um, uh, the study program and what offers have they got. So uh, come up on stage guys. Um, I guess got a big line. Fill the whole stage up. Maybe more on that side. More on that side, everyone. Keep going. <laughs> S squeeze up like sardines. Um, all right. So, um, starting. Wait, really? Starting with Alex. Guess you got this. <laughs> Hello, can everyone hear me? Yep. Yeah, um, I'm Alex. I. Before I joined RSP, I did, um, I was second year, so I finished ADESA. I got an offer from Acuna Capital and Amazon. Um, I was, um, when I started, I was in first year. I was just doing OOP. Um, got an offer from Atlassian and Optiver. I'm Sebastian. Uh, so, yeah, before I was doing RSP, I did, I was just going into programming. Um, and I got offers from Jane Street and Acuna Capital. Hi, I'm Costa. Um, I was in my second year and before I did RSP, I did ADSA and I got offers from Amazon and Boeing. 
Hi, my name is Devansh and I was in second year as well. I did ADSI and I got offers from Atlassian. Uh, hi, I'm Arsh. Uh, I was also second year and I also did ADDS and ADSA and I got offer from Atlassian as well. Um, hi, I'm Costa. I was doing uh, my first year and OOP before RSP and I got an offer for an internship and now a grad role at Atlassian. Uh, hi, my name is Parth. Um, I did RSP on my second year after doing ADSA and I got an offer from Atlassian. Hey, I'm Vic. Um, I um, I did my RSP when I was in second year and then I got an offer from Akuna and Wisetech. My name's Hamish. Uh, I did RSP in my first year and I got an internship at Optiva. Hey, my name's Shiv. I did RSP after my first year after doing OP OOP and I got an offer from Optiva. Hey guys, I'm Jun. Um, you guys probably already know me from Competitive Programming Club. Um, so I actually did RSP after um, just doing OOP um, and I got an offer from Google. Hi, uh, my name is Sriram. I did RSP in my final year of Masters and I got an offer from Atlassian and I'm working there right now. Hi, I'm Shayla. I did RSP my first year and I got an offer from Google and uh, Amazon. <laughs> it's me again. Um, so I guess, yeah, Sean, I'll um, I started uh, at my first year and no most notable offer is Google. Hey, I'm Charlie. Uh, I did RSP in my first year. Um, I got an internship at IMC. It's another trading firm and I'll be at Google this year as well. Hi, I'm Daniel. I did RSP in, after my second year and I got offers from Palantir and Atlassian. <laughs> Hi, I'm Patrick. I did, my, I did RSP in my second year after ADTS and I got an offer from Optiver. Hi guys, my name is Jason. Um, I started RSP, RSP during like, no actually after OOP and I got an offer from Google and Intel. Uh, hey guys, I'm Dudley. I did RSP after doing object oriented programming and I'm now working at Boeing. Hey guys, my name's Dion. I did RSP in my first year after doing OOP and I got offers from Atlassian and Google. Hey, my name's Hugh and I did RSP uh, um, in my first year after taking OOP and I got an offer from Atlassian and also made it into the final round of Google. Hi, my name is Nam. Uh, I did RSP in my first year and I got an offer from Google. Hey, my name is Nathan. I did RSP after ADS, uh, ADDS and ADSA in my second year and I got an offer from AirWallX and Canva. Hi, my name is Jolene and I did um, RSP after doing Open first year and I got an offer from Google. Hi, my name is Ren and I did RSP after my first year and I got an offer from Akuna Capital. So that's um, everyone. Uh, and I wanted to show their faces so when we have pizza, you know who they are and you can come and spread your questions across everybody. Um, just so you know, Sean and I don't get swamped. Um, these guys uh, really know how to get into these companies and uh, uh, thanks for that everyone. Yeah, cheers. Good turn out. Um, so we're going to do um, a question and answering. So we've got a, a few people to stay on um, stage. Um, can I stay here? Can I stay here? Um, so we'll hand out some mics. Um, so share out, share, share some mics around. Um, there we are. Just clip on one. Um, just turn it on. All right. So um, is that one on as well? Uh, you just switch, switch it on. Good job. Um, cool. So, um, alrighty. Uh, if you guys have questions, just stick your hand up and yell it, and I'll repeat it back in for the recording um, into the microphone. And uh, yeah, we'll answer any questions you have. Uh, so we'll go for as long as you have questions. Pizzas are going to be ready in like 25 minutes. So uh, if 
questions go all the way through to then, um, that's fine with us. Um, so, uh, yes. You do. Uh, s sorry, could you repeat that? So in the first five weeks, will I have multiple opportunities of the interview for the hurdle? Uh, so you can apply uh, uh, to get through the hurdle, um, but uh, uh, it, it isn't that hard to pass the hurdle. Um, the large majority do pass, but if, if you do um, have time for a second one, uh, your mentor will give you a, um, a second one if there's time. But if you uh, have only one interview at the very, very end and you don't pass, then not sure about that. Um, uh, actually, um, I think it might be better if we actually do run some microphones. Could, could I get a, um, like a, few, a few helpers? Um, maybe like two or three to stand on each aisle and then we'll, we'll hand out these, these handheld microphones and run them across everyone just so people aren't yelling. So uh, one in each aisle, uh, uh, one on the end, one in the middle. Um, and then uh, I, I, think, I think that's fine. I think uh, one, uh, one in the middle is fine, yep. Uh, all right, okay, so uh, next question. Uh, uh, guys who are running mics, uh, run around and, and hand microphones to everyone, everyone with hands up. I already have multiple jobs then, so is, is RSP, RSP still necessary if I already have some jobs, although not a, not a bank scale companies, but still decent, decently sized ones? Yeah, so first and foremost, RSP is supposed to teach people the skills to pass interviews at big tech companies, so even if you've worked other jobs before in the software industry, it can still be incredibly helpful for you guys. Um, and in fact, that would be a good benefit to you as well because that is something that is good to put on your resume as we get further into the program. That is true, but if, what if I'm already working at some of these set companies, so, so if, if, if it's difficult to dedicate some time, is it? Then what should be my options be for RSPs? Okay. Uh, so I got a few offers from, from interesting startups apart from Atlassian, so I can understand the question really well. So uh, I would say is my advice would be like, yeah, if you're getting FANG, always take up a FANG offer because it teaches you a lot in, in a graduate room, even at Atlassian, uh, because, and it's, it really sets you up for future. Uh, if you've got some interesting place that you all got, uh, RSP, I mean, you can always take it up. RSP is still useful because of the, you kind of have a lot of, you can take a lot of mock interviews, and you can also give a lot of mock interviews. For me, that was the biggest takeaway, uh, because that kind of eased me up as I'm in a new country and in a new interview style. And yeah, that's what set me up for success in the interviews uh, in Atlassian and various other places. Yeah, if that answers my questions, that's I do want to add to that real quickly. If you already have you know, a few job offers or you're working somewhere, RSP will give you the opportunity to apply elsewhere, perhaps even get a pay raise, or you know, be able to move to the United States if that's what you want to do. So these jobs in big tech can give you those opportunities that the other jobs you already have don't, and that's something that uh, should be taken into consideration as well. Uh, and as a mentor, previous year, I also referred some of my mentees for other companies. So sometimes you can also source reference from your mentors if you've worked really well and if you've reached advanced. There are a lot of previous graduates in the Discord server that you can network with, I, which I generally do not suggest RSP for networking, but like, yeah, yep. that's about it. Maybe um, next question. Um, next question, uh, who's up next? Just uh, say hi and start talking. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Kang. So actually I joined um, uh, RSP last year, but I didn't make through um, the very um, stage because like, I didn't really put in the effort. Um, so this year I'm going to join again. And I've already um, read through the books like the IDM one, but um, it is really hard to understand some of the concepts. So do you know what is the, you know, like any recommendations for the resources um, you know, like you to queue one. or like to get through the right. ADM books. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, sure. I can, I can, I can give some insight into that. So, thank you. Um, so, if you've done RSP before and you've done the theory before and you've had trouble understanding the most of the theory the first time, I think what we're going to do this time around is we're going to compile a list of resources on top of ADM and uh, CTCI that you can walk through to help you understand them better. I've received feedback that visual 
um, explanations of the diagrams were quite helpful. We'll try and compile a list of those just to aid in the experience a bit better. Um, if you are doing it again, um, j just, just in general, if, if anyone's here doing it again, uh, you will have to go through the theory study interview once more. Um, it, it's, easy, it's made easier the second time around, and we'll try to help uh, a bit more in the learning experience as well uh, this summer. Um, I might also add to that, um, it, uh, if you're doing the theory study and you're struggling through it, um, when I read ADM, uh, I struggled through it as well. Uh, every paragraph, I was like, what the, you know, what the hell is that? I don't get it. Um, so I, uh, my method was to constantly pause reading, um, go to YouTube and just like watch four or five YouTube videos on, on, like, on that topic and then go back. Uh, and I just went back and forth between, like, between YouTube and reading uh, until I understood it. And if you do that type of technique, and, and you don't have to always go to YouTube, you can, uh, you can Google other resources as well, um, or read other books, or, you know, but uh, use uh, algorithm design manual as your guide, but when you don't understand, just pause and go and learn and come back. Um, uh, next question. So, um, how much uh, successful, um, what's it called, mock interviews uh, should, would qualify for intermediate, um, the intermediate stage? Um, hello? Yeah, so, um, honestly, you can go through RSP without passing a single mock interview. It's pretty brutal. Um, I think, like, typically, by your, like, 10th one, you probably will pass one if you're really lucky. But it's supposed to be really hard. There's not really any bar there that's like, hey, if you don't pass three mock interviews by this stage, you're going to get kicked out. You're not going to make it into Google. You might as well just drop out, right? There's nothing like that. It's just, it's just there as a way to reflect on your own improvement. And that's what mock interviews should be used for. So there's no like bar there. Yeah, so I'd like to add to that, like, mock interviews are there to prepare you for the worst possible scenario. Your real interviews will not be fair. I mean, they will be on a lot of environmental conditions if your interviewer is fatigued uh, and a lot of other parts. So it just sets you up that if you take, give it a, if you get a pass, that means you're doing really well and you'll, there's a very high probability that you'll do really well regardless of circumstances, regardless of the interviewer. So, yeah. Mock interviews are really helpful. Awesome. Uh, next question. Uh, uh, I'm in second year, and uh, because this summer I already uh, applied to some internship, so I don't quite think I'm going to join this session this year, maybe. So what if I joined in third year? So is the question, what if you join in third year? Is that the question? Yes. Um, uh, I think I'll answer that one. Yeah, uh, I, it's it's fine to uh, to join whenever you want. Um, uh, Suram did the program at the end of his masters, and he went straight into a grad role. So y y you can just do it when you're ready, if you want. Um, so yeah, absolutely, you can do it whenever you want. Yeah, maybe I just want to add to that. Uh, how many years is your degree? Uh, three. Three years. Okay, so that would mean that if you're in your third and final year, you'd be applying straight for grad roles instead of internships. So it's slightly different. The interviews would be longer. And doing it this year would give you the opportunity of doing an internship this year, going to it and saying, you know what, this is not for me, and then applying elsewhere in your grad year. So that's something you might need to take into consideration as well. Just really quickly to add on to that even more, even if you are in your third year and you're still looking for an internship, you can say that you are going to be doing an honours year, which means you're still technically in your penultimate year, which is a requirement for an internship. Um, and then you can also decide to not go ahead with an honours once you have that internship. Um, I pretty much did that. Just add that to that a bit more. Um, <laughs> the conversion rate from internships to full-time offer is a lot higher than just getting a full-time offer. So it's, I, I, like, ideally I'd say get in your door, get your foot through the door as an intern and you'll get a full-time offer a lot easier. Yeah, I'd definitely say the, the earlier you get into RSP, the better. You will just like cruise through uni. Um, uh, like uh, I think Ravi was saying, like, and uh, Sean was saying, like ADDS was just nothing after RSP. So um, if you have the opportunity to do it now and you're early in your degree, it's definitely worth it. Uh, next question. Um, how many hours a day do you think it would like this program would take? Like, would we have time for a part-time job? Oh, I'll go for it. Uh, 
Yeah, so <laughs> um, during the RSP, I worked full time as a software engineer, and it was very difficult. But um, I got all the theory out early in the way. I think no matter what, you have to know where your priorities are, and I put RSP over my full time job. And I think I dedicated probably an average of 30 hours or so, maybe a bit more than that, every single week. And that's just kind of like the sacrifice that you have to make. So as long as you can weigh your priorities and know what's more important to you, you're fine. Yeah, just to add to that, get the theory stuff out of the way with early, and then if you're working, you can, you know, sort of balance it a bit more easily. Um, during the peak time, I was doing an internship and working part-time alongside, and that was definitely really brutal. So the less you're working, the more time you can spend on RSP. That's of course, goes without saying, so it's about just finding the right balance, but getting theory out of the way with early is the right way. Oh, add to that, that's fine. All right. Next question. Okay, I have two questions. First one is, uh, I actually currently have no clue what industry is like, so I don't know what direction I'm gonna do in the future, like for example, data analyst or like business analyst or like cybersecurity, I have no idea. So would this program help me figure out? And the second question is that, um, I do not require too much. I just want to find a job in Adelaide. I don't care if it's a big company or... Well. Yeah. So after, <laughs> so I mean like, uh, after I finish this program, am I assured that I would find any job in Adelaide? As yeah. long as I'd, I'd, be happy, to I'd be very happy to weigh in on that. So in, in regards to the first <laughs> question, um, uh, yeah, I think RSP is definitely a good way to sort of find your interests. I, I was definitely in the same position as you where um, I was sort of interested in like a very wide range of things. Um, and I think RSP gave me the opportunity to sort of, sort of just narrow that down. Uh, in terms of getting jobs, um, I applied for pretty much anything and everything I could because I didn't know if I'd get a big tech interview or uh, offer. And I got five offers um, from fairly notable companies. And it was, I think you'll be fine. Just don't stress about it. Um, it's a lot easier than you think. Um, I'll answer your first question, uh, not, wanting, uh, not knowing where to go. Um, so uh, in my undergrad, I just took forever to finish. Um, I was a bit slack. Uh, but I, every summer I would intern at, in random companies with random uh, teams. So I, at Palantir, I did like f uh, full stack. Uh, at Microsoft, I was kind of pure front end. Uh, I did site reliability engineering at Google. Um, and I did machine learning pipeline engineering at Atlassian. Um, and by the end of it, I, I had a good idea of what I wanted to do, and I, I thought I wanted, I thought I knew what I wanted before, but I had to actually go and try them to know what I wanted to do. So if you're not sure, just really try and get internships in many different places, and then decide. Um, don't try and like think, oh, I don't know what to do. What what should I apply for? Just apply for everything, and just kind of go with the flow and. Uh, uh, as a university student, you shouldn't be locking yourself into anything because chances are, like the majority of you all sitting in this room think you know what you, uh, what you want to do and in five years from now after working as an engineer, you're going to hate it and not want to do that thing. So uh, try and use this beautiful opportunity of being a student who can just like, you know, taste a bunch of different companies uh, and different, different roles and use that, um, that really valuable time in your life to, to try and fast forward uh, uh, your understanding about what you want to do personally. Um, uh, and uh, also add to the second one as well, um, uh, sorry to take up all the mic, all the mic space, um, is uh, there's this analogy I like to use. It's, you know, it's, you know, sh shoot for the stars and you hit the moon. Uh, it's, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta like study really, really hard and aim for like the thing that feels impossible. For some that's Google, for some that's uh, Optiver, or for some that's Jane Street, like some of the really, really big high frequency trading companies or, uh, or tech companies. Uh, and even if you don't want to actually work there, like let's say you want to work at like a smaller startup company, um, because that kind of work is pretty awesome. Um, and, uh, but you want to guarantee that you do get that offer at the startup company. Um, the bar for passing those interviews is simply going to be like a slightly lower than getting into one of the really big um, for, um, uh, companies. So if you study really, really hard and try and get into a really big company, uh, then and, and let's say you get really, really close uh, to getting those companies, the, uh, and your skills are almost at their uh, like um, at that level, the chances that 
that you want to pass the uh, like the easier company or the or the slightly smaller company who have a slightly lower bar is is going to be nearly 100%. Um, so that's why all of you should always aim for the thing you don't want, uh, even uh, like just to make sure you do get the thing you uh, you do want. Um, unless you want the really really hard thing, then aim for that. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, uh, next question. Hi. Um, sorry, I was just wondering for all the tech interviews that you've had, if you could sort of summarize in like one point, um, I guess just like a takeaway message of like something that you should focus on or like a key point that people should like look into, what would it be? Yeah, um, so the tech interviews, so they first they check to see if you have the technical proficiency, so can you code or not? That's kind of like a must par bar and that's like the very bottom line. So you have to be technically proficient enough to pass that interview. But then beyond that, um, part, once you get past that point, what delineates you from the other candidate isn't if your code is slightly more cool or if it's a bit faster or things like that. It's how you sell yourself as a person. So after passing the coding criteria, it's how can you effectively sell yourself as a potential prospect to the interviewer? Uh, there's also another aspect like, can you walk, your, can you walk through, the, through your solution with the interviewer? Like you need to explain exactly what, I mean, you need to interact with the interviewer because at the end of the day, software engineering is a very interactive job. You need to communicate effectively. That's what they'd be looking, at least in Atlassian, they do a lot. So uh, it's just not that you can write, fastly write a code in five minutes or 10 minutes. It's just about how well, how readable your code is. I mean, uh, the, uh, it's also cool maybe, but yeah. So, uh, <laughs> oh uh, yeah, and it's how simple your code is. Like, did you complicate your solution? Like, this is something that you, gain as a practice, as you practice more and more to write really elegant code. I think something, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, I also think it's really important just to remember that the interviewers are also human. Like, they're not there to just interrogate you and then leave. Like, um, I remember in my Amazon interview, I just started talking to the interviewer about games, just like out of nowhere. And it was really casual, it was really chill. It's just to just don't stress about it um, and just have a conversation really. Uh, next question. Uh, oh, I see some hands up, guys. Yeah, so let's say you do get the internship. So do you work like, do you do the internship and do uni full time at the same time? Is that usually how it works? Uh, it runs usually towards the summer. So the summer break is when you'd be doing the internship. So you won't really be doing it while you still have university. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so if you're interested in like machine learning, what kind of companies should you kind of aim to interview out, I guess? Uh, yeah, this is, I think this, is <laughs> this one's for me. Um, so, uh, I know there are like two companies in Adelaide that do do data science, machine learning. Um, I actually forget their name. Uh, maybe Concilium does AI, or if, if you guys remember. Yeah, do you guys know? No, okay. Um, but in terms of some of the bigger companies, um, if you want to do machine learning or data science, um, so Canva definitely take data science um, interns. Um, absolutely they do. Um, so does Atlassian. Um, and if you want to do machine learning at one of the big tech companies like Facebook or um, Google, Microsoft, uh, uh, often you just apply for a software engineering position, but then you set your preferences to like be a machine learning engineer. Um, however, if you wanted to do uh, some more researchy stuff, so if you wanted to like work for DeepMind or OpenAI and be a researcher in those teams, um, uh, you start to look at different positions that isn't necessarily software engineering and the interviews require different stuff that RSP teaches. So if you wanted to be like a, like a, a machine learning uh, researcher or an applied researcher um, doing machine learning, then uh, you probably want to look at doing uh, uh, a master's by research or a PhD and do uh, specific PhD internships as a research scientist. Um, but that's, uh, let's, but the main thing is uh, uh, for first, second, third years, uh, and you, if you want to get into it, um, 
definitely just you know apply for software engineering often but um i know canva and Alassian that i know of um, actually have specific um internship titles on, on, the, on the websites um hopefully that answers the question oh thanks yep cool uh Next question. Just one more question, if that's all right. I just wanted to know, yep, right here. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> a little bit short. But I just wanted to know if, um, the same question for her, but for cybersecurity, so that type of area, any big companies, any companies in uh, like Adelaide and stuff like that, or even outside of Adelaide, that I would be, someone like me would be aimed to go for it, that's all right. Uh, yeah, sure. So before I uh, switched to software engineering, I was in, enthusiastic for cybersecurity as well, so I was in a similar pursuit, you could say. So, um, j just contrasting cyber and RSP, j uh, j just to get that out of the way. If you do decide to do RSP, a lot of the stuff you'll be learning will be quite helpful for cyber interviews, but you'll also have to do cyber content on top of that. So, uh, in fact, I'd say it's probably a better idea to do the, uh, go through the public RSP route, just because lead code won't help as much as, um, say, capture the flags and things like that. So your question was about uh, companies. So uh, a lot of the big tech companies do have security engineering and cybersecurity roles. I'd say they're probably a bit harder to get into just because there's fewer spots available. So there are some companies, notably Australian Signals Directorate, that has um, a lot of cybersecurity options. So I'd say that's probably one of the better ones to go to for cyber, just because like I, uh, when I was there, I was working on network protocols. The guy on the other end of the room to me was working on like spyware, and the person on above me was working on data science, and it was all cybersecurity related. So uh, ASD is quite a good option for cyber. Uh, next question. <laughs> How much does it cost? Your life. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Free. Cost of elaborate. Yeah. So initially, when Ravi started this program, um, I guess there were a few kind of missions in mind. Um, <laughs> for, no, first off, so I, I think for Google, Facebook, those kinds of companies, um, previously UNSW was the biggest producer of interns, um, and we want to change that. So we want to increase the number of interns that Adelaide, Adelaide Uni and Adelaide in general is producing. And one of the other guys might have more stats on that, but I think they were pleasantly surprised with how many came from Adelaide um, as a result of last year's RSP. Yeah, so um, uh, I'll, I'll elaborate on that because to clarify, yeah, absolutely free for everyone. Uh, no student will ever pay for this. Students shouldn't have to pay to learn how to get a job. Um, so that's answering that question. But then elaborate on, on kind of why uh, the, the program exists in the first place. Um, uh, yeah, Adelaide, I want Adelaide to be number one in, in Australia of getting um, big tech in, interns. And uh, we were like sixth um, before the program. And after two years, we're now tying the number one university, UNSW. And they actually have four times the number of computer science students than Adelaide does. And we're producing the same amount of big tech interns, uh, specifically for Google. I'm using Google as my, my like stat. Um, they've got more students, so I'm sure they're getting more students other companies. But um, uh, I'm proud about that. And hopefully, we can overtake. But yeah. Uh, next question. Oh, hi. Uh, so you previously mentioned mentioned that uh, RSP will also help in uh, uh, research programs apart from software engineering. So will this be helpful for quantum computing? Maybe. No thanks. <laughs> um, so I actually haven't taken quantum computing. That uh, that course came about after I finished my undergrad. Uh, has anyone here taken quantum computing? Um, uh, in terms of like, uh, like, I don't think there are any like intern software engineering type places where you can go and like work on a quantum computer. If you want to do quantum computing, you've you've got to like, if you want to do it now or as soon as possible, you've you've really got to go down the research route. Um, we do have. Um, uh, two researchers, or now three actually. Um, so there's Francis, TJ, and Mike from the Australian Institute of Machine Learning, um, and they are uh, TJ is like their supervisor. Um, Mike's a, po a postdoc, and Francis is a PhD student doing quantum computing. But yeah, uh, uh, RSP isn't necessarily going to be able to uh, help with that 
exactly because we're aiming specifically for software engineering roles um, and you've just got to go down like the research route probably email TJ um, say I love quantum com computing and he'll take you straight away because he's trying to find people <laughs> yep awesome um, next question uh, uh, hi okay so I, uh, my question is that I'm going back to my home country during summer would I be able to do this a uh, program online, or yeah. is it everything online? Yeah, everything's online, That's so it right. okay. doesn't matter where you are, um, as long as, and it's pretty much um, self-organized, so uh, it's when you find time to do the work. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I did it in back home as well. Uh, yeah, I did it back home as well in Indonesia. Um, yeah, All right, uh, uh, while Patrick's here, if anyone has any like international questions, uh, international student questions, maybe just screen them out and Patrick will quickly answer them. Just, just yell them. He, he can answer it too. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyone? International uh, student Sorry. questions? Yep. Um, would you say, as an international student, what are the disadvantages? Uh, I can summarize it for you in one sentence. If you're interning, you can't apply for uh, Atlassian and Amazon. And, uh, but uh, actually, no, Amazon and Akuna. But later on, for grad, you can apply for them. But uh, Atlassian and Palantir, that's bye bye. All right. Um, yeah, how much? Um, so, uh, I have one more question. I, I think we should do. Um, is uh, 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 one sec. Uh, is pizza here already? By the way, I, I, I thought I'd ask. Not yet. I'm just gonna ask. No. All right. No. Questions continue. Sorry. We'll Sorry. just keep going until pizza's already, <laughs> and then and then we can all eat. Um. Right, anyways, continue. Uh, yeah. So uh, for some sectors like uh, the defense sector, like for international students, it, like the, uh, they cannot specifically directly work on th those sectors, right? Because they need some PRs. Or maybe uh, like the citizenship. So, uh, are there some like can being an international student can we work in uh, the space sector of Australia? Um, I'm not sure I got that. I don't. I don't. I don't think so because uh, I'm an international student. Uh, so, I don't think you can work in defense. And you can check with a lot of companies uh, whether they allow international students to work. But uh, here's something like, uh, as an international student, I can give you an advice. Apply for as many companies as you can. If you apply for like 10 f companies, 15 companies, I applied, f I, I almost gave interviews for more than 10 companies, more 10, 15, I applied for almost 30 companies. So as you keep applying for more and more companies, keep a track, keep an Excel sheet, use whatever tools. The thing is, you can crack two or three interviews. You can, I got three offers from Safety Culture, Quiller, and Atlassian. But yeah, that, that's the advice I can give you as an international, as an international student, that uh, just apply for more. The probability of getting an offer is get, goes higher as you apply for more companies. And for defense, um, you need to be a citizen uh, for defense. Yeah, Thank they're you. just not a permanent residence. Yeah. And you also need to get NV1 clearance, so no yeah. fancy stuff. Um. <laughs> uh, yep, next question. Uh, top right. They really make him work. Yeah. <laughs> Good Hello. stuff, man. Hello. Hi yep. there. Um, so I've got a question. So this is neither domestic or, nor international question, but um, it's more about like when you apply for a job. So. Does it really matter if your GPA is low when you apply for jobs? Sorry, I mean, for free? For free? GPA is low? No. Who's <laughs> your oh, GPA? Oh, GPA is low. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can answer it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so when I applied, I think my GPA was like, I think it's like 3.6 or something. It wasn't, it wasn't too good. Um, I got a GPA reset, so I'm chilling now. But um, <laughs> it does close a lot of doors for you at the very beginning because you do get screened out by like the AI. They're like, "Hey, if your GPA is not high enough, they just chuck you out of the door." <coughs> but um, if like once you pass that initial barrier, they don't really care about it anymore. And as long as you can justify your GPA with your other experiences, they're like, they'll be understanding. <laughs> but that's at least my takeaway. 
just want to add on top of that as well. Uh, I think what we said in the program was if it's below six, don't include it on your resume. So they're not going to know and you get to the next stage. <laughs> yep. Yeah, my GPA wasn't amazing either, to be honest. Um, but I never got asked about it once. So don't stress about it. Just don't put it on your resume. Uh, and also to add to that, so my, G, uh, my entire transcript is an absolute boss crash. Um, I transferred like three times to a bunch of different courses. Uh, I failed two courses and like, you know, so it's, uh, I did have some like weird questions from some interviewers, um, but like you can kind of just brush it off and say, oh, you know, I was going through stuff at that time. My mum was sick and, and the, <laughs> you know, like, and the interviewer is always going to be like, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. and <laughs> it's always going to be fine. So, like, <laughs> like it isn't this hard cap where if, you, if your transcript or your GPA is bad, you're screwed. It's just not the case at all. As long as you can be a salesman, y you can get through anything. So, like, yeah.